Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Engineers Analysis brought to you by Shankar Ice Academy for the date 12th of December 2021. These are the list of news articles that I have chosen today for discussion. Now in this first discussion we are going to see about the 5G technology and we will see what implications it, it will have to the aviation sector. And in the second discussion we are going to see about two tribal communities from the northeastern states. They are the Chakma community and the Hajong community. And then in this discussion we are going to discuss about molecular chaperones which are a type of proteins. And then in this next discussion we are going to dis discuss about the Pinaka rocket launcher. Then we will see about Rajaji and uh, few of his uh, accomplishments. And along with that I have three practice questions today. Then I have a quiz question also. So pay attention to the discussion. Then we will have one mains practice question. So without wasting much time now let us move on to the first news article discussion. So our first discussion is going to be based on this article. It is a science based article. This article talks about the molecular chaperones and it also talks about what this molecular chaperones do in our body. See as the name itself suggests molecular chaperones are something that is in the molecular level. So it can't be seen with the naked eye. Therefore, in this discussion, we are going to understand about these molecular chaperones from the exam perspective. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. Now, first to understand the molecular chaperones, we need a basic understanding of DNA. So, what is DNA? It is the deoxyribonucleic acid. It is the molecule that contains the genetic code of organisms. So, DNA is the material that carries all the information about a living thing that is needed for functioning properly. For example, DNA in humans determine things such as what color our eyes should be and how our lungs should work etc. Now this DNA, it will be converted into a messenger RNA in our body. This messenger RNA is in short called as mRNA. Now this process of converting is called as transcription. Now this process is the one by which the information in a strand of DNA is copied into a new molecule of messenger RNA. So the information from DNA is copied to messenger RNA and we saw that DNA holds the genetic information of a living being and now this information is made into copies in the transcription process. Now after this process proteins will be formed. So that means mRNA forms the basis of protein formation. Here understand the terms it forms the basis of protein formation. So why we need proteins? See proteins are the building blocks of life. They are important for growth and development in children, teens. They are important for pregnant women. And we also need protein in our diet to help our body to repair cells and make new ones. So proteins are quite important for humans. And now the process by which a cell makes protein is called as translation. So while making proteins they use the genetic information carried by the messenger RNA. And we already saw that mRNA is made up by copying DNA. Therefore, the information which is carried by mRNA tells the cell how to link the amino acids together to form proteins. Now, they are guiding the amino acids because they are the basic structure of protein. That is, a chain of amino acids forms protein. And that is why we say that amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Now, these proteins, they should be folded to become useful. Now, before understanding this particular line, I am going to show you a video which I have taken from a website called Your Genome. If you see this video, you will understand the formation of protein and it will end with the folding of protein. I will start with what do we mean by folding of protein. Thank you. 
So now let us see what do we mean by folding of protein. See when the translation completes, the flow of genetic information within the cell also completes. And due to this translation, the sequence of nucleotides in DNA has been now converted to the sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. What is a polypeptide chain? See, peptides are short chains of amino acids which are linked by peptide bonds. So, polypeptides are nothing but a polymer of amino acids, a group of amino acids. Now, this synthesis of polypeptide or the combination of polypeptide does not mean that a functional protein has been produced. It just means that the amino acids have been grouped together but they are not yet ready to become functional. So, what has to be done for the amino acids groups or the polypeptides? to become useful. For this they must fold into distinct three-dimensional conformations and in some cases multiple polypeptide chains must assemble into a functional complex. Along with this many proteins also undergo further modifications which are critical for their functioning and these modifications are also important for correct localization of these proteins within the cells. So that means protein folding is nothing but the physical process by which a protein chain is translated to its native three-dimensional structure. So typically a folded conformation is when the protein becomes biologically functional. So here you should note that there are also unfolded proteins or misfolded proteins. These proteins contribute to the pathology of many diseases. Now this is where the molecular chaperones come in because the proper folding of proteins within the cells is mediated by the activities of other proteins. So these proteins that facilitate the folding of other proteins are called as the molecular chaperones. Why the chaperone term is added here? Because see literally in English chaperone means a companion that is a person who accompanies or who looks after another person. So here these molecular chaperones they look after the protein folding process. Or scientifically we can say that these chaperones act as catalyst that facilitate assembly without being part of the assembled complex. So with this understanding now let us see the characteristics of these molecular chaperones. First of all we should note that these chaperones do not convey additional information that is required for folding of polypeptides into their correct three dimensional conformations because the folding is determined solely by the sequence of amino acid. So what these chaperones do? They just catalyze protein folding by assisting the self-assembly process. In addition to this, what they also do is that they bind and stabilize the unfolded or partially folded polypeptides. These are the ones that are intermediates along the pathway leading to the final correctly folded state. So the molecular chaperones help in binding and stabilizing these unfolded polypeptides also. Now if these chaperones are absent then the unfolded or partially folded polypeptide chains they would be unstable within the cell and what will happen is they will frequently fold incorrectly or they will be aggregating into insoluble complexes. But since there are presence of chaperones they will bind to these unfolded polypeptides and stabilize them and thereby they will prevent incorrect folding or aggregation and it will also allow them to fold correctly. Now in addition to this many of the proteins which are now known to function as molecular chaperones they were initially identified as heat shock proteins. See these heat shock proteins are a group of proteins which are produced in cells when the cells are subjected to elevated temperatures or other forms of environmental stress and the abbreviation of heat shock proteins is the term HSP. So that means HSPs are specific proteins that are made when cells are briefly exposed to temperatures above their normal growth temperature. This is because when the cell is subjected to elevated temperature or stress, at that time the protein begins to lose their original shapes. That is, they will lose their three-dimensional biologically functional shape. And here the elevated temperature or stress is what is called as heat shock. So to restore the proteins to their original form, large quantities of chaperones are produced. And some of the examples of these molecular chaperones are HSP70, HSP90. So you can understand why there is HSP because these were the proteins which were initially identified as heat shock proteins. Now here the number along with these HSP indicates the size in kilodaltons. Dalton is nothing but a unit of mass. 
so these hsp 70 hsp 90 they have the ability to detect the temperature changes and stress so these are some of the characteristics of molecular chaperones now let us see why we need them see we already saw why we need them now we are just going to group them as points now the first major significance of molecular chaperone is that they assist in protein folding now secondly they also have an indirect significance which is they prevent diseases caused by improper folding of proteins here let us take two examples to understand what this means see the alpha synuclein protein which are present in neurons is wrongly folded in parkinson's disease that means when the alpha synuclein protein they are wrongly folded or incorrectly folded then it leads to parkinson's disease and similarly if we take crystallins these are the predominant structural proteins in the lens when these are folded incorrectly then it leads to cataract in the eye so like this these improperly folded proteins or incorrectly folded proteins they lead to many diseases now thirdly chaperones also play a vital role in maintaining cellular hemostasis so hemostasis is a process which the living things use to actively maintain stable conditions that are necessary for survival so chaperones help in maintaining cellular hemostasis and it ensures that the cells are not subjected to stress but if cells are subjected to any temperature change or stress it immediately restores the original shape of the proteins so that everything functions normally in addition to this these chaperones are also used as biomarkers of exposure to environmental stress in the fish see it is found that the industrial effluents hydrocarbons metals pesticides etc they induce hsp in fish so that means if hsp is present in fish then the fish or the water body is subjected to these environmental stresses so these are some of the useful functions of molecular chaperones but apart from all these uh, functions it also has certain drawbacks for example cancerous cells accumulate mutations in protein that would normally suppress tumors but the hsp70 and hsp90 they play the roles of villains here because they continue to fold the mutated proteins so they allow tumor progression that means these hsps or molecular chaperones they do not differentiate between normal cell and cancerous cell rather they help in folding of proteins in both these cells so if it happens in normal cell then it is fine for the human body but if the same happens in a cancerous cell then that means it will lead to tumor progression but here we should note that scientists have developed inhibitors of hsp90 when we say inhibitors it refers to the substance which binds to these proteins and which decreases the activity of these molecules and as per the scientists these inhibitors of hsp90 they show much promise as anti cancer agents but even now no inhibitor has yet been approved for human use because the levels of inhibitors used for human purpose or to be effective in humans are too toxic for the human body and that is why as of now no inhibitor has been approved for human use so that is all in this discussion we understood what do we mean by molecular chaperones we saw how proteins are formed and we saw some of the important functions of these molecular chaperones and finally we also saw one of the drawbacks of molecular chaperones so with this discussion now let us move on to the next one now this news article talks about a census regarding two communities that are predominantly found in arunachal pradesh these communities are the chakmas and hajongs see a chakmas and hajong census was conducted in the state of arunachal pradesh recently so one of the groups representing these communities has criticized that this census is a racial profiling operation and therefore they have filed a complaint with the prime minister's office so in this discussion let us see about chakmas and hajongs and we'll also see the issues faced by these communities the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference first let us start with chakmas see chakmas are a tribal community they are one of the buddhist communities in the indian subcontinent and anthropologically speaking chakmas belong to the branch of tibeto burmese tribe and this tibeto burmese tribe originally belongs to the mongolian race now let us see about the chakmas based on two different time periods now one period is prior to the british rule in india and the other period is after the independence of india 
So first let us see about chakmas prior to the British rule in India. See note that chakmas at that time had an independent kingdom and this kingdom consisted of the present Chittagong Hill tracks, the portion of Chittagong district of Bangladesh and it also included a Dhaka trunk road and even some areas bordering the southern parts of Mizoram. This is the region as you can see here. This is the Chittagong Hill track and the Chittagong district region in Bangladesh and these are the areas where we can find chakmas and during 1715 it is said that the Mughals had a war with chakmas and the Mughals won in that war so chakmas had to pay a tribute to the Mughals but after British East India Company took over the administration of Bengal in the year 1757 this tribute was transferred to the British now what happened after British rule that is after India's independence See, it is said that on the day of India's independence, Chakmas wished to join India. But since the Chittagong Hill tracks where the Chakmas lived was made part of Pakistan, it could not happen. To be more specific, we know that this region was included along with the eastern Pakistan, which is now called as Bangladesh. But now, why we talk about Chakmas most often? See, the Chakmas are the people who were displaced when a dam was built on the Karnapuli river and this dam was called the Kaptai dam. See this Kaptai dam was completed in the early 1960s and it was built in the present day southeast Bangladesh. So during the construction of this dam many Chakmas they migrated to other regions of India and furthermore once when the country of Bangladesh was formed in 1971 at that time also tens of thousands of Chakmas migrated to India. And uh, when they migrated, they were settled by the government in the Indian states of Mizoram, Anachal Pradesh and Tripura. So now let us see some of the characteristic features of uh, this tribal community. See first, Chakmas have their own language. This language is known as uh, Changma Bach or Changma Hoda. But now they speak a dialect of Bengali. This is because Chakmas have a centuries of contact with their neighboring Chittagongian population. Along with this, they also use Bengali alphabet. A next important fact you should know about Chakmas is that they officially follow the southern form of Buddhism that is the Theravada Buddhism which is also called as Hinayana Buddhism. Now if you look at the festival celebrated by Chakmas they also celebrate the Buddhist festival like uh, Buddha Purnima and they also celebrate the uh, Biju festival which uh, coincides with the Bengali New Year. As you know Biju is a festival that bids farewell to the previous year and welcomes the New Year. Now next important fact about Chakmas is their occupation. See their major occupation is cultivation. They grow paddy, maize, cotton, sesame etc. And mainly they practice jhum cultivation that is the slash and burn cultivation. And they also know the art of lowland cultivation along with this. So these are few facts that you need to know about Chakmas. Now let us see about the Hajongs. See Hajongs are also a tribal group and they are native to the Indian subcontinent. They are located in the northeastern Indian states and they are also located in Bangladesh. And note that Hajongs belong to the Bodo Kachari people and they claim that their ancestral home was in the Hajo area which is uh, in the present day Assam now. And then they speak the language called Hajong and note that if we talk about the ethnicity then the majority of Hajongs are Hindus and as of now it is said that most of the Hajongs are settled in India. Therefore they celebrate some of the Hindu festivals like Durga Puja and Kamakya Puja. And they also celebrate festivals like Biswa. See, Biswa is a pre-monsoon festival and they celebrate Kani Puja, Katka Puja, etc. Just know the names of these pujas. Now, what about their occupation? See, like the Chakmas, Hajongs are also cultivators. But both of these communities follow different methods of cultivation. Predominantly, Hajongs are rice farmers. And it is said that Hajongs have brought the wet field cultivation to the Garo Hills. And before this, the people of Garo Hills, they used uh, slash and burn methods of agriculture only. But after the arrival of Hajongs, they also started using wet field cultivation. And note that Hajongs are spread across the states of Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya and even other northeastern states. And most importantly, both of these communities, that is Chakmas and Hajongs, they have been listed as scheduled tribes in these states in our country. Take a note of this. Now let us get to the issues faced by Chakmas and Hajongs in India. See, as you can understand that Chakmas are migrants. And even a part of Hajongs who belong to Bangladesh, they have also majorly settled in India now. So, 
Hajongs are also migrants to some extent. And therefore, both of these communities face the issue of citizenship. Now, you may ask that Government of India announced the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019. Then why is there an issue of citizenship? It is because, as you are well aware, even though Citizenship Amendment Act provides a chance for the migrants, but the areas in Arunachal Pradesh is not covered under this act. It is because of the inner line permit. So you can recall that there is a clause in the Citizenship Amendment Act which says that the act doesn't apply to the tribal areas of Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram or Tripura uh, that are included in 6th schedule to the constitution and it doesn't even apply to the areas covered under the interline which is also called as the inner line permit and we know that this inner line permit system prevails in the states of Anachal Pradesh, Nagaland and Mizoram. So that is why the citizenship issue of Chakmas and Hajongs will not be resolved by the Citizenship Amendment Act and that is why they are struggling to get their rights in India and they are losing on many benefits like uh, they do not get access to the food grains under public distribution system. So like this they are facing many issues already and now there is a new issue which is mentioned in the news article. See, since the census was conducted only for these two communities, the group that represents this community, it states that the census operation is nothing but racial profiling. So what is this racial profiling? See, it refers to the process by which the law enforcement relies on uh, generalizations or stereotyping based on uh, race, color, descent, national origin or ethnic origin. So here the law enforcement does not focus on the objective such as evidence or individual's behavior rather just because they belong to a particular race, color or descent or ethnic origin they are subjected to certain actions by the law enforcement agencies and these actions include uh, they are stopped while they travel to some places they are uh, searched by the law enforcement agencies and they are even subjected to investigation just because they belong to that particular community and this is why Racial profiling is a dis discriminatory process and because of this census operation now the people from Chakmas and Hajongs they fear that this will lead to racial profiling of Chakmas and Hajongs. So let us wait and see what happens regarding this issue uh, whether the Prime Minister's office conducts an investigation in this matter or not. So that is all. In this discussion we understood about two tribal groups in the northeastern states these are the tribal groups of Chakma and Hajong. And we also saw the issues faced by both these communities. With this information, let us get to the next discussion. Now, look at this FAQ article. It talks about the impacts of 5G technology in the aviation sector. See, primarily this FAQ article discusses the recently released Airworthiness Directive from the United States Federal Aviation Administration. So, based on this directive, the FAQ discusses how 5G equipment can impact the aviation industry's function and uh, the implications of this directive to India. And finally, it also discusses what are the steps to be taken to ensure that 5G technology and aviation sector can coexist. So today we are going to discuss all these aspects. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. See, first of all, let us have a brief understanding about the 5G technology and its evolution. Now look at this table here. Here you can find the information regarding the evolution from 1G to 5G. Here what you should note is the bandwidth. See, bandwidth is nothing but is like a width of the river. We know that if the width of the river is wider, it can carry more water. So, in a similar way, if the bandwidth is higher, it can carry more data. So, similarly, the 5G technology, it has the capability to add more bandwidth and therefore it has the capacity to carry more data and it can have more functionality. Now in this table you can also see that the frequency range is also increasing with each generation. See when we use our phones our data is coded as digital signals in the radio waves that our phones are using. So if the frequency of the radio waves is higher then more data can be encoded and we saw that 5G technology has more frequency then more data can be encoded in it. That Therefore, it has more bandwidth that will help us to transmit more data. Now, currently for the common use, 5G will be rolled out in the C-band, if you see. So, what is this C-band? It is a part of the radio wave spectrum.
spectrum where the frequency range is between 3.7 gigahertz to 4.2 gigahertz or we can say that it is between 3700 megahertz to 4200 megahertz so this is the c band range but just now we saw in the table that 5g offers a frequency range from 3 gigahertz to 30 gigahertz but even still why mobile operators are choosing this 5g c band that lies in the frequency range of 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz it is because c band has some advantages see the c band frequency range for 5g provides rich opportunity for the operators it delivers a balance between coverage and bandwidth which will benefit many verticals and applications see this c band offers both good coverage and good throughput so what does coverage means it refers to an area up to which the mobile tower can transmit the signal on the other hand throughput means the actual amount of the data that is successfully sent or that is successfully received over the communication link so this c band offers both good coverage and good throughput but in case of 5g if the frequency is higher than c band then it can offer very high throughput but the coverage will be very low we need not know the technicality here just know that it can offer very high throughput but the coverage will be very low now on the other hand if the frequency is lower than the c band then it can offer very good uh, coverage but very low throughput only and that is why the mobile operators are choosing the c band range so these are the basics that you need to know about 5g c band and its advantages now why we are discussing these terminologies it is because recently the united states federal aviation administration has released two airworthiness directives see these directives were aimed at creating a framework as well as its aim was to gather more information about the potential impacts of 5g technology on crucial aviation safety equipment as you know uh, faa is similar to our directorate of civil aviation in india so faa aims to ensure safety and efficiency in the aviation industry in the united states of america and these airworthiness directives released by united states faa are legally enforceable regulations and they are released to correct and unsafe condition in a product so here point to be noted is that these airworthiness directives are legally enforceable so now these directives are released for 5g technology because there is an unsafe condition in this 5g technology especially with respect to united states see usa has already rolled out 5g technology and by january 2022 many mobile operators are planning to roll out 5g in the c band because as we saw it has many additional advantages but now the federal aviation administration is concerned that this 5g c band frequency is close to the frequency in certain important aircraft equipments and this is a cause for concern so why this c band is a cause of concern for the aviation sector let us see that now now to understand that first you need to understand about altimeter see all medium and large aircrafts have two types of altimeter they are the pressure altimeter and the radio altimeter simply you just know that altimeters measure altitude now in case of pressure altimeter it measures the altitude of the aircraft in relation to the mean sea level now in case of radio altimeter it measures the height of the aircraft from the surface which is immediately below it so here you can easily understand the difference between height and altitude so height is measured by radio altimeter and altitude is measured by pressure altimeter now this radio altimeter is very important instrument for precise approaches and landing of an aircraft that means the radio altimeters play an important role in the safe operation of the aircrafts along with this they also provide valuable information for other equipment that help in predictive wind shear that help in ground proximity warning system traffic collision avoidance system and that help in auto landing so this radio altimeter helps in other aircraft functions also and therefore for an aircraft to function properly a lot depends on the efficient functioning of this radio altimeter now the issue is with respect to the frequency range of this radio altimeter see this radio altimeter uses frequency range of 4.2 gigahertz to 4.4 gigahertz but we already saw that the 5g c band it falls in the frequency range of 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz right that means there is a potential for 5g c band to interfere with the operation of the radio altimeter but just now we saw that radio altimeter is important for safe functioning of the aircraft especially in the landing and therefore any disturbance caused to this internal radio altimeter caused either by the 5g equipments or uh, other equipment transmitting in the frequency bands close to it can result in a disastrous effect and therefore it will affect various crucial systems that aid in the safe landing of the aircraft and the faa directive which we saw is also concerned about this particular fact 
and that is why the directives have been given by the authority so now let us see what are the takeaways from this directive to understand what is the issue between the 5g connectivity and aircraft functioning with respect to usa see according to captain a ranganathan who is a former airline instructor pilot and aviation safety advisor there are four important points in this directive we are going to see only these four points see the first point is that the directive prohibits the use of autopilot mode in helicopters in the areas that have 5g connectivity that means auto hovering cannot be used in these areas what is this auto hovering see hovering is a state in which the aircraft is in a nearly motionless flight and this motionless flight is over a reference point at a constant altitude so if hovering is done without an intervention of a pilot then it results in the auto hovering mode but since the 5g c band falls in the frequency range of 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz it will interfere with the radio altimeters and therefore this auto hovering function cannot be used and that is why the directive prohibits the use of autopilot mode in the areas where there is 5g connectivity this is the first takeaway now the second point is that the directive also prohibits certain instruments such as instrument landing system approach then the required navigation performance operations and auto land let us not go into the technicality of these uh, processes just know that prohibition of these will result in additional flight times and it will also lead to requirement of more fuel for each flight in addition to this it will also lead to the increase in the time gap between two flights because the flight times are increasing and therefore all this will lead to increase in flight delays so this is the second point now the third and the most important thing is the issue of handheld mobile devices see as you know majority of the air passengers they do not switch off their phones therefore this particular thing could pose extreme danger when the aircraft is flying in the vicinity of major airports where there is 5 5G connectivity. So even if we ban 5G towers around the airports, but if the passenger switches on his or her phone when the aircraft is nearing the airport, then there is a potential for the 5G to interfere with the radio altimeter in the aircraft. Therefore, it will affect the safe landing. Now, finally, according to Captain Ranganathan, for commercial aircrafts, the risk is very limited to some specific circumstances, such as low visibility landing. But even in such case, if there is a false input to the autopilot system due to the erroneous signals. resulting from the 5G C band then it could also result in a crash of the aircraft so this is also an issue so these are the four takeaways from the FAA directive now does this directive have any implications on india or whether india should also follow the same kind of directive it is not so because in india our government is planning to roll out 5G in the frequency band of 3.2 gigahertz to 3.6 gigahertz but we saw that most of the aircrafts use radio altimeters with a frequency range of 4.2 to 4 4 gigahertz only therefore in case of india the potential for interference is very low and that is why as far as india is concerned we have no need for worry so what is the solution to this problem how 5g and aviation sector can coexist how can we use 5g without affecting the aviation sector see for this the first suggestion is that mobile operators can operate in certain frequencies within the c band itself they should leave what is called a buffer between 5g signals and the frequencies that are used in aviation for example how india is planning to use we are going to use 3.2 to 3.6 gigahertz so similarly other countries can also use this frequency band rather than nearing that 4.2 gigahertz limit so this will directly reduce the interference between 5g and radio altimeter now the second suggestion is that there needs to be a lot more research to realize uh, the full implications of 5g on the radio altimeter and other aircraft systems so we need research in this arena and then only we can take a well informed step now thirdly in case of india according to captain ranganathan he has suggested to the dgca that it should order a ban on 5g towers within the 15 nautical mile radius of any airfield he is suggesting to ban 5g towers in this radius it is because around many airports many densely packed urban areas are coming up so if there is a 5g tower in this area and if, and if there is any interference with the aircraft's radio meter it will lead to disastrous consequences so that is why he is suggesting this the same can also be used by usa in the current scenario and the final 
general suggestion is the easiest, safest and the cheapest one which is staying away from 5G as of now. Author is suggesting that we can stay away from 5G until there is further research regarding this issue. So that is all about 5G and its effect on uh, aviation sector. In this discussion, we understood what is 5G and uh, what is the C-band and what are its advantages. We saw how it will affect the functioning of aviation sector. So in that, so while discussing that, we also saw about the altimeters, especially the radio altimeter and why it is important and what are the problems associated with 5G and radio altimeter. And finally, we saw some of the way forwards that could avoid the issue between 5G and altimeter and which could help in the coexistence of 5G along with aviation sector. So with these points in mind, now let us move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is going to be based on this news article which talks about the testing of Pinaka Extended Range Multi-Barrel Rocket Launcher System. It has been tested by the Army. Now the significance of this testing is that this current testing used Pinaka MK1ER rockets that were produced by an industry partner. Here ER stands for Extended Range. Now this technology of the Pinaka MK1ER rockets were transferred by the DRDO to the industry partner. So after that, the industry partner manufactured these rockets with DRDO's hand holding during the production and quality assurance period. So now coming to the Pinaka Extended Range Multi-Barrel Rocket Launcher System. This system was jointly designed by two laboratories of uh, DRDO. These laboratories are Armament Research and Development Establishment, that is ARDE in Pune, and then High Energy Materials Research Laboratory, which is HEMRL in Pune. So with these initial trials, the initial phase of technology absorption of Pinaka ER by the industry partner has been successfully completed. So this has made the industry partner ready for series of production of this rocket system. So this is the crux of this news article. But today we are only going to see about Pinaka Extended Range Multi-Barrel Rocket Launcher System or simply the Pinaka multi-barrel rocket launcher. This is the image of this rocket launcher. As you can see why this is uh, named as multi-barrel. You can see that this launcher is mounted on a truck. Now this truck is indigenously produced and this truck is called as Tatra or Tatra. Now this truck can carry a payload of uh, 12 tons. Now it is equipped with an onboard generator which supplies the primary power for launcher operations. Now coming to the Pinaka system, it has two pods as you can see in this image and each of these pods contain six rockets. Now one of the specializations of these Pinaka system is that this launcher is capable of firing in salvo mode within 40 to 48 seconds. And through this it can neutralize the area of 700 by 500 meters. See what is this salvo mode? It means that they can just hold on to the button and then it will simultaneously fire missiles. So within just 40 to 48 seconds, all the missiles will be launched in this salvo mode. Now note that this launcher can be operated in four modes. These are the autonomous mode, standalone mode, remote mode and manual mode. Now in case of autonomous mode, the fire control computer, it independently controls the launcher. Now next is the standalone mode. Now in this, the command is entered into the console by the operator. Now the next one is the remote mode. Now this one allows the operator to control the launcher from a distance of about 200 meters using a remote control unit. That is, there is no need that they have to be present in this launcher. Now the final mode is the manual mode. Now this mode is adapted in the event of uh, failure of microprocessor and loss of power. So that means in four different modes this launcher can be operated and that is why this makes this launcher widely adaptable and highly reliable. Now in this launcher, various variants of rockets are used and these are called as the Pinaka rockets. Here is the list of these Pinaka rockets and you can see the range of these rockets. Just go through this. So now what is the application of this Pinaka in the battlefield? Why is it important? So in the battlefield, long range artillery systems like Pinaka are used for attacking the adversary targets prior to the close quarter battles. That is, this system tries to neutralize the target before it could come close. And when the targets does come to close quarters, then at that time small range artilleries, then armored elements and the infantry are deployed to neutralize it. So that means the main aim of using a Pinaka system is that it acts as a first line of defense and it protects the smaller artillery and infantry. So these are some of the few facts that you need to know about the Pinaka launcher system. 
and its significance now let us move on to the next discussion so our last discussion is going to be based on this news article which talks about the birth anniversary of sri rajagopalachari who is popularly known as raja ji and this news article talks about his political career and the controversial education scheme that was introduced by him so today what we are going to do is by taking this opportunity we are going to learn about sri rajagopalachari from prince point of view so let us start the discussion first note that he was born on 10th december 1878 he was born at hosur which is currently present in the krishnagiri district of tamil nadu and as i already said he was popularly known as raja ji now some of the important facts about him was that he was the first and the only indian to be the governor general of india he was also an ardent patriot a pioneering social reformer a sharp thinker a profound scholar and also an author Apart from all this he was also an eminent statesman and able administrator his merits and traits elevated him to hold many highest positions such as he was the governor general in free india as i already said then he was also governor of bengal then he also held the post of premier of madras presidency and he was also the chief minister of madras state and he also held the post of minister for the home affairs of indian union So keeping these points in mind let us see a timeline describing the major events in his political career see in 1900s he began his career as a lawyer in salem now by the 1905 the swadeshi movement was developed due to the partition of bengal now this incident changed the life of raja ji because after this only the 1906 congress session was held in calcutta and raja ji attended this session he also attended the 1907 surat congress session And then in 1916 he started the Tamil Scientific Term Society he also joined the Home Rule League and even started a branch of the league in Salem in Tamil Nadu then in the period 1917 to 1919 he served as the chairman in Salem Municipal Council and during that period he brought such as he eradicated untouchability in the region he promoted education among backward classes of people he promoted education among the people from backward classes and he also promoted samapandi virund which means intercast dining and then in 1919 he became the prosecutor in madras high court but after that he quit his lawyer profession when he met gandhi ji in chennai after meeting gandhi ji he even participated in the raulat satyagraha and then he participated in the non cooperation movement in chennai in 1920 then after this he was sentenced to 3 months of imprisonment for attending a public meeting but after his release from this prison he even wrote a book called as sirayil tavam he wrote this book in 1922 and then he was elected as a member of congress working committee but then in 1922 itself gandhi ji was arrested so raja ji was given an additional responsibility this responsibility was publishing gandhi ji's journal young india and then in the same year he even attended the gaya congress session and followed the path of gandhi ji and from then on he played important role in national politics also he even participated in the vaikum satyagraha that happened in 1924 and in the same year he started an ashram in a place called as pudupalayam which is near trichangodu in tamil nadu see this ashram was constructed on the model of gandhi ji's sabarmati ashram and he even named this ashram as gandhi ashram so remember this gandhi ashram is in pudupalayam near trichangodu in tamil nadu Now in the year 1929 Raja ji published a Tamil magazine called as Vimoshanam from this ashram see this journal dealt about prohibition of liquor and then in the 1930 he was elected as the president of Tamil Nadu Congress committee so due to his accomplishments Gandhi ji even praised Raja ji as my conscience keeper and then 1930 assumes an important role for Gandhi ji because on March 12th Gandhi ji began the famous dandi march and he even broke the salt law on April 6th of 1930 and this was called the salt satyagraha if you remember now after this event immediately raja ji along with 99 congress volunteers he started another salt satyagraha yatra in tamil nadu it was started on April 13th 1930 it was held from trichurappalli in tamil nadu to vedaranyam so as a part of this yatra raja ji took the satyagrahis and broke the salt law and got arrested then after this in the year 1932 raja ji became the acting president of all india congress party 
and he even played a key role in the signing of Pune Pact. So after his election to the All India Congress Party, Congress even contested in the Madras Province election for the first time. It happened in 1937, and in this election, Congress won. So because of this, Raja Ji became the Chief Minister of Madras Province in January 15, 1937. Now during his tenure as chief minister he passed many laws such as he passed the agricultural debt relief act to solve the problems of farmers then he formed a new committee under the then revenue minister to remove zamindari system then he passed the temple entry authorization and indemnity act this act gave legal right for the depressed class people to enter into temple and then during his rule only liquor prohibition was enacted for the first time in the madras province it was enacted in 1937 itself so along with all these reforms and acts he also introduced gandhi ji's vardha scheme of education in schools and this scheme was the one which triggered controversy regarding the education and then in the year 1938 he even made hindi as a compulsory second language in schools in tamil nadu this was made compulsory from 6th to 8th standard actually this was the issue which paved the way for anti hindi agitation in tamil nadu but then raja ji and his cabinet resigned in 1939 because the british government made india to participate in the second world war without indian leaders consultation so after this 1939 came the important 1944 when raja ji formed or formulated the c raja gopalachari's formula which is in short called as cr formula see so this formula was primarily formulated to resolve the political deadlock between the all india muslim league and the indian national congress so many proposals were part of this formula such as uh, you know it is proposed that the muslim league would join hands with the indian national congress to demand independence from the british then mainly this formula also suggested that both the parties would cooperate and form a provisional uh, government at the center and then in case of partition joint agreements should be made between uh, both the regions for safeguarding defense communications and commerce so like this many proposals were part of this cr formula so these are the few facts that you need to remember when we talk about c raju gopalachari who was an active politician and a satyagrahi so with this news article discussion we are moving to the next session of practice questions discussion let us take up this first question it is a two statement question and this question is based on our molecular chaperones discussion let us see the first statement proteins that facilitate the folding of other proteins are called molecular chaperones this statement is correct because this is the main function of molecular chaperones now the second statement molecular chaperones do not facilitate refolding of unfolded proteins caused by stress this statement is incorrect because during discussion we saw that this is an indirect function of molecular chaperone it also refolds the unfolded proteins which are caused by stress so statement 2 is incorrect now here the question asks for the incorrect statements so be careful before marking the correct answer the correct answer to this question is option b 2 only now let us take up this next question it is a pair based question on one side tribes are given and on the other side type of agriculture is given now let us look at the first pair chakmas wet field cultivation the statement is incorrect because during discussion we saw that chakmas practice jhum cultivation that is the slash and burn cultivation now the moment you know that first pair is incorrect you can eliminate options a and b because the question asks for the correctly matched pair now from the remaining options we can easily say that pair 3 is correct maldari tribes practice pastoral farming see maldaris are basically pastoral community pastoral means animal herders and these tribes they live in the bunny grasslands in the ran of kutch which is in the state of gujarat and they also live in the gir region so they have a close harmony with lions so maldari tribes is known for their pastoral farming and they are known for their close harmony with lion along with this they are known for rearing unique breeds of livestock namely concrete cows bunny buffalo and then karai camels now let us look at the second pair hajong jhum cultivation now this is incorrect because it should have been matched with the wet field cultivation during discussion we saw that hajongs are predominantly rice farmers and they practice wet field cultivation so the correct answer to this question is option c 3 only 
Now let us take up this question. It asks which of the following given laboratories are associated with DRDO that is Defense Research and Development Organization. Let us see the options. Center for High Energy Systems and Sciences, Institute of Nuclear Medicines and Allied Sciences, Snow and Avalanche Study Establishment, Center for Fire Explosives and Environment Safety. See the correct answer to this question is option D, all of the above because all of these laboratories are associated with DRDO. In this the CHESS is located in Hyderabad and INMAS is located in Delhi and SASC is located in Chandigarh and CFEES is located in Delhi. So viewers with these three practice questions now I have this quiz question for you. This question has been framed on the uh, Rajaji discussion. It is a two statement question. So read each statement carefully and then you can post the answer in the comment section. And as usual I will tell you whether your answer is right or not. Now this is the main question for today. It has been framed on the first discussion that is the 5G discussion. We have to write answers in 250 words. Interested aspirants can write answer to this question and post it in the comment section and whenever we get time we will review your answer. So viewers with this we have come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis and practice questions discussion session. If you like this video do not forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAC Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil services preparation. Thank you.